uh, back for yet another season. We love them so much. The sound of their voice, just the image of them popping up on the television makes us smile. Easy, and, you're going to give him a big head. <laughs> and he's got a big enough one already, and that's Ron Darling who joins us now. Ron, good morning. How are you? Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, Ronnie, so give me your first impressions of what David Stearns has done here, the roster, what it looks like in your eyes, and can they be better than most people think that they're going to be? Yeah, it really feels like it, uh, Boomer and Geo. Doesn't it feel uh, so different from last year when there were so many expectations you brought in or you had the two Cy Young Award winners and you just thought that everything was going to fall into place after 101 wins the year before, but... Um, I don't know, watching them all spring training, um, attention to detail, all those little things that are important and cliche, what does that mean for the season? I like the roster. I think offensively, they, um, and with Eric Chavez back as the hitting instructor, I think uh, the offense is the given uh, on this team. And it's just, um, it's going to be what they get, to me anyway. Um, I think the bullpen's uh, strong enough, especially with Diaz back, but you know, what they get out of Severino, what they get out of Manaya, um, and holding the fort until Senga comes back, I think is the, to me, is the true test. Do you think we're going to see a major difference between the way Buck Showalter handled this team and the way that Carlos Mendoza will be handling this team? That's a great question. You know, Buck in his first year, um, everything just went so smoothly, and it seemed as though um, – Everyone in that clubhouse just uh, enjoyed playing for him, loved to him, uh, his stories and his wisdom. And something got lost in the second year. I don't know what. Uh, you know, you don't know unless you're in that clubhouse. But somehow something got lost because, um, you know, Buck didn't all of a sudden not become a smart baseball guy in one year. So, um, you know, for, to spend a lot of time, uh, well, some time with Carlos Mendoza, Mendy, and, uh, you know, not not only, you know, he's going to come across as a very nice guy and smart guy, and he's done everything you have to do, checked all the boxes to be a manager, but there's a toughness in there when you meet him and when you're talking to him that um, he he wants to be great, and sometimes that's half the battle. So we're talking to Ron Darling, obviously SNY, TBS, baseball analyst, former Met. Um, hey, look, the uh, the starting rotation, you, you spoke to that. I'm worried about third base and Brett Beatty. I, I, I don't know what that whole thing is going to happen, you know, what, what's going to happen there. Yeah. To me, every other position on the field has got a legitimate big-time baseball player playing that those positions, but third base seems to me – that uh, hopefully this kid is going to actually improve on last year and be ready to take over here. But uh, your your impressions now of what's going to happen there at that position? Yeah, Boomer, it's uh, it's been an important position ever since uh, David Wright left, right? Um, I, I think that it would have been easier for Beatty to break in with the 22 team, 100-win team, 101-win team. Maybe he could have flew under the radar um, a little bit, and it would have given him a chance maybe um, – to not to have whatever pressure uh, that was there or he put on himself. Um, that being said, uh, you said the, the lineup is extremely strong. Um, I think that, you know, in today's game, there is uh, so much information and so much intelligence. But once the game starts, um, I would love to see a little more junkyard dog in Brett Beatty. I, I think he has the talent to play at this level. I think he has the talent to flourish at this level. But once the game starts, uh, I would just love to see him just forget about all the, um, all the intellectual or, or intelligent information you get and just fight, just compete, because I believe he's got the talent uh, to do it. Now, he's going to have uh, a period of time where he's going to be able to prove if he belongs here. And if he doesn't, you know, Vientos is waiting in AAA. So I think – I always bet on the athlete when there's someone behind them pushing them. So uh, I'm going to bet on Beatty. I hope we hear the trumpets and see Edwin Diaz make a triumphant return today at City Field back from a year off. But uh, is it fair to worry about him this season? Because prior to the injury, he was a hot and cold guy. He was up and down, bad season, good season, halfway good season, Hall of Fame season. So now he's coming off an injury. Is is it just a given that he's going to come back and be the best closer in baseball again? Do you have any concerns about that? 
Yeah, that's not a given, Gio. You know, I, I think that any time you're a pitcher and you come off a major leg injury, everything's uh, connected, interconnected, right? Uh, and he's such a whirling dervish kind of motion as the pitcher. There's arms and legs flying everywhere. And, um, you know, so there, there takes some time coming off uh, any kind of major injury for a pitcher to make sure everything is kind of synced up. I saw him in spring training where everything looked like 2022, and I saw him in spring training where things did not look like that and did not come easy. So um, I don't think it's going to be automatic, uh, maybe in the month of April. But as he gets his legs under him, literally and figuratively, um, I think he'll have a big year. Uh, he's got to have a big year. Uh, that bullpen needs him. So I always think about defense up the middle <clears throat> and also think about offense up the middle. So you got a batting a leader over there at second base. You got Francisco Lindor at short who had it down here offensively. You got Bader out in center field and it all starts with the catcher. Uh, are, are we going to see a major improvement, uh, you know, from our young catcher, Francisco Alvarez? Uh, well, I, I know he's put the work in Boomer. You know, there's two things he wanted to prove on. Uh, the, the relationship with the pitchers, that's a hard thing always for a young catcher. Uh, pitchers are very enigmatic, and uh, and it takes a while to get their trust. He worked really hard on that in spring. Second thing he worked on, and he had to, of course, in this game that's changed where the stolen base is a such a strength for the offense. Last year, I believe, hopefully I got the numbers right, he threw out 13% of base runners. Um, that's not going to make it. I know the the average is 19%, but with his arm, he should be closer uh, to 25%. So I know he's worked really hard on his footwork, he's tried to get better. And if you watch some of the spring training games, I barely did. Uh, he looked much better uh, throwing the ball and threw some, uh, threw some runners out. So those two parts of his game, he has to get better at defensively. And then off offensively, it, it's the same for him as it is for any young player. The huge fluctuations that he had offensively last year from month to month um, have to kind of close up a little where, um, you know, a bad month for him is when he hits uh, a 220, 230 as opposed to 150. Uh, you know, those huge fluctuations you hope change in the second year. But uh, I don't know if, 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 you're, if you're thinking of a future star, well, it's, it's a good place to rest your hat uh, is with Alvarez. Yes, it would be. <clears throat> so the other thing for me, Ronnie, is I want you to put your national baseball analyst hat on, not not the Met analyst hat for a second, okay? Okay. So the Mets are out of the playoff running. The trade deadline is here. What are you doing with Pete Alonzo? Whoa. Um, boy, what a tough call. Um, you know, a, a, a quick anecdote. So the uh, I was at a spring training game. I brought my little guy. He's eight years old. He had two of his friends. I went to take their picture unknowingly. They, they were there. I took the picture. They turned around and took another picture. And they all three had Alonzo jerseys on. Uh, they didn't match that up. They didn't talk about it. It's just how, how important or popular he is with the fan base. So that makes it difficult. But um, if you're out of it and you've got a guy that you uh, – it depends on really on what kind of year he's having, a uh, boomer. Um, and also, you have to remember, if you do trade a Pete Alonso because you're having a difficult year, that doesn't mean you can't re-sign him as well. So, um, you know, I think they've proven in the past, at least last year, that they're not afraid to trade anyone if the expectations of the team don't meet uh, what they thought they would be. Yeah, and this is going to be something that happens the entire year. It's going to be a storyline, whether he's playing well or not playing well. It's just going to be its going to be tough to take. It's too bad that there wasn't some sort of resolution before the season. Uh, you've been around David Stearns uh, a little bit, I would imagine, um, and, and met him. Tell me why we as Met fans should trust his vision. Well, I, I just think that uh, there's a combination there that um, I think is really intriguing. Um, any uh, general manager, uh, president of baseball operations, whatever you want to use as the title, um, you come into a house where Steve Cohen owns the team, you can get run over. I mean, talk about an alpha dog, right? Mm. But uh, he is not that person. I think, you know, he has trained in the right way. He's been through uh, those seasons in Houston where they lost all those games and built that team into one of the best teams in baseball right now. Um, he is now, then he went to the 
uh, Brewers who spend less money certainly than most teams in the game and still put together teams that uh, went to the postseason five out of six years. So you're going to get the combination that you've always been looking for, that sweet spot of having really talented, well-paid players that meets the uh, continuous continuous uh, infiltration of young players, young, talented, athletic players coming from your farm system. And the trading of Scherzer, Verlander, and others, that's going to be uh, one of the greatest coups that's ever happened in baseball. For the first time, a team went out and used some of the greatest players, Hall of Fame players in the game, uh, to restock uh, their minor leagues with young, athletic talent. That has never happened in baseball before. Uh, as far as my recollection. So what is concerned. what what is this pitching lab that the Mets supposedly mm. have now? What what is that all about? The pit, the pitching lab uh, is where you go as a pitcher and with the track man and Rapsodo and all the machinery that can measure um, you as a pitcher. It also tries to maximize your mechanics so you're throwing the ball in a better way. Now everyone throws the ball differently. You know this from from tossing that football boomer. Everyone throws it differently. It can all be successful. But there are some foundational kind of things, some fundamental kind of things uh, that can always help you uh, get a little better. So that's really what it is. It's a lab to go to discover maybe what could be a version of you, whether it's breaking balls, added velocity, mechanics, all of the things tied into pitching uh, you can go there, and I, I'm old enough to remember the $6 million man. I remember what they used to say, uh, they, they can rebuild you. He can rebuild him. Well, that's kind of what they do at these pitching labs. They take a look at you, and they see what you can do, and they try to push you to that next level. And um, every team has it now. Some teams do it better than others. Just another minute or two with Ron Darling. Make sure you watch all the coverage today on SNY. Opening day at City Field. Gary, Keith, and Ron and Steve Gelb's back for another year. Excited to see them. Uh, you saw Keith have his day, and now this year you're going to see Doc and Daryl get their days. Uh, when you're up in the booth and down on the field and experience those things and seeing those two guys with the ups and downs of their career uh, in that Mets uniform, what do you think your emotions are going to be like? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to be uh, uh, have a lot of emotions, Gio, and they're all going to be positive in a sense that, you know, uh, Doc and uh, Daryl, I'm sure, did not have the, the full career they would have liked in a Mets uniform. Uh, but this is really a chance uh, both ways uh, for both of them to say thank you to Mets fans and for all the adulation and adoration that they got from one of the most special fan bases in the game. Uh, but also a chance for the fans uh, to show how special they were. There was a time when Strawberry hitting a home run on a Friday night when Doc struck out 15 or 16 batters that it didn't get any better watching baseball in New York. And I know a lot of, uh, a lot of our fans have, would like one more chance to, to give them that standing ovation. You know, what I worry about for you, Ronnie, is just keeping Keith, uh, like, focused <laughs> and keeping him involved because if the season goes haywire he goes haywire <laughs> and then somebody's got to be the adult in the booth you know that right listen listen as you guys know from what you do not being focused is one of his strengths sometimes you know what i mean like hey. he, he 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 brings it in uh, the most unusual ways if you give him a one nothing game with unbelievable defense and clutch hitting He'll give you a, a clinic on how to play the game. But if, if it's 15 to 2, uh, we're going to get some of the best uh, of Keith that you ever get. There's yeah. no one who does broadcasting right now that can do what Keith Hernandez does in the booth. And uh, I'm lucky to work with him. Yeah, that, that is a great point. And by mm -hmm. the way, it's interesting, Boomer, that you say you need Keith focused when you yeah. try to knock Ronnie off his game and his focus by texting him 7,000 times a game. <laughs> uh, I. I I love the text. Every time they come in, um, if they're worth sharing, I'll share them with the booth. If it's a private kind of thing, I kind of have a snicker on air. But uh, <laughs> I love it because Boomer, at times, here's this guy, as famous as anyone could be, mm -hmm. one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, mm -hmm. and he'll send a text that sounds the 15-year-old boomer from my stuff as a kid. <laughs> That's exactly right, and it could be in the middle of July. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a real important game because 
you know what? There's nothing like a great baseball season that tells a lot of stories. And hopefully uh, for you guys that uh, this is going to be a, a team that exceeds all expectations. 81 and a half is the over under. What's your guess? Oh, this is uh, it, it, it smells and feels like a postseason team to me. Wow. Um, they're in a difficult division, as, as uh, you know, with the um, with the uh, Philadelphia Phillies and, of course, the Atlanta Braves. But um, I watched and did the games as I watched the Arizona Diamondbacks uh, go through the Milwaukee Brewers, go through the Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, go through the Philadelphia Phillies. And the Phillies were more primed to go to the World Series than any team I've ever seen. And uh, the Mets have that kind of talent, or at least that much talent, uh, to rival the the Diamondbacks. So I think the this is going to be the Mets' year. And any time they have a big year, it makes it easier in the booth, as you guys know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Ron, it's great hearing your voice again. We'll be watching today. Thanks for the time this morning. Thanks, guys. Take care. Ron Darling, the great one. SNY. Check him out today. Mets opening day at City Field.